Good afternoon. There, there was that momentary pause, and I thought I would try to take advantage of it. And you, 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 you all got back into conversation. Um, welcome. I'm Steve McCormick, president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's event. We're here to announce the launch of our new patient care program and the first grant under that program, $9 million to John Hopkins University. We've uh, spent the past year working very hard at designing this new program and preparing it for today's launch. And we're fully aware of the significant challenges and risk, but at the same time, we're also quite inspired by the results that we hope to achieve. So we're prepared over the next 10 years to commit $500 million to this effort. Um, we're honored to have so many esteemed guests with us today. Many of you are leaders and visionaries in the field of healthcare and particularly around patient safety and patient care. And it really, it's your dedication and your vision that have inspired us to step up with this new program and be willing to commit as much as $500 million. I also want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, the staff back at the Moore Foundation in Palo Alto and guests of ours who are joining via webcast. Uh, and I particularly want to call out uh, Ken Moore, who is a trustee of the foundation and sort of an ambassador on behalf of the family. In a moment, you'll hear from Dr. George Bolin, who will describe in more detail what we intend to accomplish with our new program. And George will introduce Dr. Peter Pronovost, who will share what he and his colleagues at Johns Hopkins would like to accomplish with our first grant. Then we have a, a remarkable panel uh, moderated by Mary Naylor and composed of individuals who bring a broad spectrum of experiences and therefore perspectives uh, on this issue. Uh, but first, let me set the stage very briefly and give you a bit of a background on our foundation and how we came to develop this program. Foundation was created in 2000 by Gordon and Betty Moore. And Gordon, as I'm sure all of you know, was a founder of Intel. Today, our foundation is one of the largest in the United States with about five and a half billion, billion, it's still fun to say that actually, five and a half billion dollars in assets. And Gordon and Betty made it very clear from the outset, and they've been consistent ever since, that they want the foundation to focus its significant assets in a way that will result in the most impact. So they created, at the beginning of the foundation, uh, three focus areas, what we call programs, the areas that they intended the foundation to stay with indefinitely. One is environmental conservation. The other is science in the form of basic discovery-driven research. And the third is to improve the quality of life in the Bay Area, which is the home of the family. And after we celebrated our 10th anniversary a couple of years ago, um, not wanting to rest on our laurels and inspired by our founders, we began to think about, well, okay, what do we want to do in the next 10 years? And how can we kind of dial it up significantly so we might aim for transformational change, really profound, lasting change in each of our program areas. We started by looking at what we'd already done. And as we examined our Bay Area program, we were coming to the fulfillment of a 10-year initiative to improve and enhance uh, and expand nursing in adult acute care facilities in the San Francisco Bay Area, which was of particular interest to Mrs. Moore. And we had fully intended to have that wrap up. But as we looked at what we'd learned, as we looked at what we had accomplished, and as we looked at who we met, we realized we actually were in a great position to move from a limited duration initiative to a permanent program in the foundation. The patient care program, therefore, is a commitment on behalf of this foundation for us to engage indefinitely on this really important issue. And it's derived from the emerging evidence and belief and vision that many of you have uh, inspired in us that the meaningful engagement of patients and their families, coupled with a supportive healthcare system, will significantly increase outcomes and significantly reduce costs. I, I don't come from this sector, and it has been shockingly sobering to me to learn that well over 100,000 preventable deaths and harms occur every year. 
that's extraordinary. I mean, it was sort of like if somebody said, that's like a 747 going down every day. And if that was happening, this country would take immediate action. And yet, it's invisible. It's sort of off the screen. So it's a huge issue. And while we're prepared to commit half a billion dollars over the next 10 years, we also realize that the size of the problem well exceeds that ability, the ability of us, even at that level, to bring about the kind of changes we'd like to see. And so we're really positioning the foundation as a change maker, not just simply a grant maker. And we want to deploy our voice, our connections, our ability to bring together diverse groups, and our dedication to working with other funders to engage in collective action and collective impact. So it is a start today, but one that we see as, um, as gaining significant momentum in the year ahead. The, um, the, the challenge that we face requires the, um, the energy, the wisdom, and the experience of so many different players. And we're delighted to have, as I say, most, uh, most of you being significant players in that regard. Uh, and in our program today as well. It's my great pleasure, therefore, to uh, introduce to you Dr. George Bolin, who is the architect of our patient care program. George has worked tirelessly over the lot. Well, actually, he's gotten very tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he has worked incredibly energetically over the last year. And as a consequence, we are much farther ahead, frankly, than I had anticipated. I'm an, an impatient person by nature. I like to move things along. George makes me look slow. So I am, um, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague and somebody who I have great admiration and respect for, Dr. George Boleyn. Thank you, Steve. Hi. What a terrifically exciting day to all of you here today and all of you who have joined us on the webcast, especially those back at the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation in Palo Alto. I am thrilled to be with you to announce the new patient care program. As Steve said, this marks the first time in nearly a decade that the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has launched a new program. Let me describe the process that brought us here today. Because the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation seeks ambitious, large-scale transformation, significant, lasting, measurable results from our work, and makes large investments over years to pursue that goal, we began with examining where we can make a difference in patient care. So over the past year, we have reviewed the scientific literature. We've talked with many people outside healthcare, such as engineers and retailers, and inside healthcare nurses and physicians, other healthcare professionals, policymakers, researchers, clinic directors, hospital presidents, and of course, and most meaningful to all of us, patients and their families. We convened an advisory group of national leaders and healthcare experts, and we held meetings to identify gaps in patient care and opportunities for the foundation to build on the great work that has been done and continues to be done by many of you who have joined us so graciously here today. And we had many conversations with the Foundation Board of Directors. We greatly appreciate the generosity and wisdom of those many individuals. Through its research, the Foundation identified three aspects of patient care in the United States that need significant improvement. Everyone recognizes the first two, quality and safety and the cost of health care. And many of you are deeply committed to addressing those aspects. However, the foundation believes that just as important is engaging patients and families in their own health care. And when we say patients, we mean any consumer of health care. Let me share some observations about patient and family engagement. 26% of hospitalized patients report the clinicians failed to explain their medications prior to giving to them. Only 49% of patients are presented with treatment choices or ask their opinion. And almost half of all patients report a loss of dignity and respect when interacting with the healthcare system. 
Yet patients and their families are an unrealized, unique resource of important information, vital perspectives, and valuable partnership for healthcare. Almost all patients believe that they have the knowledge and confidence to play an active role in their own health care, even when under the stress of their medical conditions. When activated, patients have improved health outcomes across a variety of medical conditions. And when well-informed and engaged in shared decision-making, patients will choose care that is usually less invasive and less costly. But if so many patients are willing and able to engage in their own health care, why aren't they? I think we all know the answer. Because too often we in health care are not supportive of such engagement. Many of you here today, even clinicians such as myself, we know that when we find ourselves as patients facing the health care system, our confidence ebbs as though we become a different person. We are afraid that not only could we be hurt by the complexity and urgency of healthcare, but also if we speak up, we'll be labeled a difficult patient, even if it means that we expose ourselves to physical harm, unnecessary anxiety, and to silent indignity. We in healthcare need to stop harming patients. We must eliminate all preventable harms, not only medical harms, but also the harm of receiving excessive, inappropriate care, and the harm of losing the dignity and respect of one's personhood. That, too, is a measurable harm to be eliminated. When we take away a patient's dignity and respect, even unintentionally, we take our own away, too. Therefore, the Foundation has developed the program's theory of change. Improvements in patient care will be more significant, efficient, and durable by focusing on and meaningfully engaging patients and families in their own health care, tightly linked to a supportive health care delivery system. On your tables is a graphical illustration of our program's theory of change. I invite you to read through that. We welcome your input. We believe that this theory is a way to transform relationships in healthcare. I want to emphasize that a supportive healthcare delivery system does not hurt patients. It prevents avoidable complications and errors. It prevents unnecessary, wasteful, and disrespectful care, and it will reduce healthcare costs. Many healthcare professionals and organizations are developing the concept and practice of patient-centered care. And this program seeks to build on that important work. The foundation believes that healthcare must move from presuming that patients and families are engaged to ensuring that the healthcare system is continually engaging patients and their families. We want patients and their families who are engaged in their health care, who are recognized as respected members of the health care team, that they are participants as fully informed partners in shared decision making, that they have the knowledge and skills to manage when desired and appropriate their own health care, and that patients and families understand their role and the valuable contribution they make in ensuring safe, cost-effective, respectful, and above all, high-quality health care. What can we do to realize that vision? What must we do? First, create the systems of care that stops harming patients. A system cannot be supportive if it hurts patients. It must be safe. The foundation believes that patients should not have to rely on the heroism of individual committed healthcare professionals, often working in chaotic environments. To be supportive of patients and families, healthcare delivery needs to be redesigned to integrate multiple elements information technology and decision support, medical technology, interprofessional team based care 
practices that are based on evidence, systems engineering and continual learning. That systems approach would be one in which these different parts work together in an integrated, interdependent, coherent whole that supports continual engagement of patients and families. And patients and families must be part of that redesign so that the delivery system not only meets the needs of healthcare professionals to provide the highest levels of quality and safety, but also ensures that the care is delivered in a way that enhances the respect and dignity of patients and families. Second, we do everything we can to welcome and support the engagement of patients and their families in their own health care. Patients and families want and need to be engaged. We must embrace that opportunity. Third, we do that now. Now, because every moment we delay, more people are hurt. More of us lose the joy of our profession. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation believes in taking big risks for the goal of achieving big impact. And the foundation believes in collaborating with others. We want to build on and expand the work of so many dedicated individual and organizations to achieve what we all so fiercely desire, safe, affordable, compassionate care. As our first step toward that ambitious goal, we will begin in the acute care setting. Hence, we are pleased to announce a grant in strategic partnership with the Johns Hopkins Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality. Dr. Peter Ponovos, director of the Armstrong Institute, will lead the project. As you know, Peter led the work to eliminate central line associated bloodstream infections, and that work has spread now across the United States and now into Europe. This work was based on a designed system to address a preventable complication, incorporating many elements for sustained improvement with large scale adoption. This $9 million grant will create that supportive delivery system beginning in the intensive care unit setting, where too often preventable harms occur, where patients too often lose the dignity and respect for their personhood, where families are too often separated from their loved ones. The project will be designed to address all preventable harms, to engage patients, to eventually expand into the general hospital setting and to achieve large-scale adoption. We are thrilled to have Peter as a principal investigator of this transformative project. Peter. Well done. Thanks. Thank you, George. And I stand here uh, humbled at the task before me and thankful that I have such an amazing team from the foundation, from Hopkins, and frankly, with all of you to help us walk along this journey. You know, too many patients are harmed. Uh, they receive care that's not respectful, that wastes money on things that doesn't get them well. The reality is nobody wants this to happen. Not patients, not families, not clinicians, not health system leaders, not employers, not insurers, not technology companies, nobody. Then why are so many patients harmed? Why is care often so disrespectful? And why are health care costs so high? It's not for a lack of effort or will. I think it's from a lack of leadership to coordinate and collaborate among all the various stakeholders. See, in virtually every other industry, technology has improved quality and lowered costs. Not so in health care. Healthcare productivity is flat. Healthcare professionals are stressed and patients suffer. Clinicians work with tools that do not serve their needs, tools that do not talk to each other. Consider Leah Kafal, a 12-year-old whose story was told in the USA Today. You, Leah died of respiratory arrest while narcotics intended to ease her pain slowed her breathing until she stopped breathing completely. Everyone asks, how could this possibly happen? 
Yet it did, largely because the infusion pump that dripped narcotics into her blood did not routinely talk to the monitor that counts her breaths. If they did, when Leah's breathing slowed below a critical threshold, the equipment could have sounded an alarm and notified a clinician, or better yet, automatically stop those narcotics. Other industries rely much less on heroism from individuals and more on designing safe systems. They use technologies to support work. For a pilot, a plane's cockpit today is much simpler than it was 30 years ago, even though the planes are infinitely more complicated. The cockpit display is not, and by integrating technologies, it is far, far safer. Not so in healthcare. Johns Hopkins just opened a state-of-the-art new clinical building. We built the best hospital possible. We built the best ICU possible. But the best ICUs are not good enough. They look just about the same as they did 30 years ago. They're packed with potentially helpful devices that do not talk to each other, that increase rather than decrease the risk for errors, and that depend ever more on heroic efforts by staff. There is tremendous work to build upon to change this reality, work you and others have led. Yet this work has not been coordinated or integrated, and no one group could do this alone. We have to commit to work together. We've seen what's possible when we do. We eliminated catheter infections at Johns Hopkins using a simple technology, a paper checklist, and changing culture. And with funding from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, we did the same thing in Michigan. We saved lives, we saved money, and we restored joy in clinicians' work. And then with continued support and with many partners, we have now spread this program state by state across the US, and these infections have been dramatically reduced. We demonstrated that by lazily focusing on a common goal, taking a systems approach, and engaging patients and their families and providing them with data, we can realize significant improvements. Still, this effort focused on only one harm, while patients in the ICU are at risk for dozens of harms. And it was too burdensome. It relied on the heroism of dedicated healthcare professionals rather than on safe design. We used paper checklists rather than an automated decision support tools. And as a result, hospitals are working on only one or two harms where patients are at risk for over a dozen. This new program, made possible by the generosity and the vision of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, is about to change this. It's daunting. The Foundation's new program will ensure that patients and their families are meaningfully engaged as part of the healthcare team. And we will design a healthcare system that works to eliminate all harms, and that it will learn and improve and most importantly, it will be accountable for the results it produces. We will produce a model in the ICU. The product will form a little mini Bell Labs, drawing upon the full richness of our university, bringing together an amazing and diverse team from the Johns Hopkins schools of medicine and nursing, public health, engineering, business, the Berman Ethics Institute, and importantly, the applied physics lab where Gordon Moore once worked. And we're delighted to have the University of California, San Francisco as our initial partner on this work. While this work builds upon prior improvement efforts, it differs in two fundamental ways. First, it defines patient harm from a lack of dignity and respect as a harm that is every bit as real and important as an infection. Second, it works to, work, it works to reduce all harms starting with goals and then working backwards to design the kind of care patients deserve. Now, I'm aware that when we hear these phrase systems approach, there's more than a little confusion about what does this really mean. And perhaps it's best to start out then by itemizing what it's not. It's not telling doctors and nurses to work harder. It's not accepting harm as inevitable rather than preventable. It's not working on a couple harms where patients are at risk for a dozen. It's not only recovering from the mistakes that occur, but also learning from them. It's not providing care without clear goals, measures, and accountability. So let's imagine what it might look like. Imagine your loved one's admitted to an ICU after cancer surgery. You're actively involved in her care at a level that's comfortable to you. You're, you provide information about their symptoms, what your, your concerns are, and you're actively involved in knowing what's going on and participating in these decisions. Clinicians are using technology to predict what harms your loved one is at risk of suffering. They're using technologies and they have a checklist of the over 200 therapies 
that are needed to keep patients safe every day in the ICU. You can look at any given time of day and you know whether they've been given, when they've been due, and most of them are automated because the devices monitoring care are connected. You sleep well knowing the infusion pump would alert staff and shut off if your loved one's breathing slowed. You are confident that the staff will have time to provide comfort to your loved one, listening to their concerns, holding their hand. You attend rounds daily or whenever you choose, sometimes by video conference, sometimes in person. You are provided a daily report on how well your loved one's symptoms were managed, how well the team performed those 200 things they're supposed to every day, and the results that it actually achieved. The staff work continuously to learn and improve. You can feel that the staff are working as a team and that they're joyful. You can feel that you and your loved ones are treated with respect and dignity. And amazingly, the care is much less expensive. All of this is possible today. Technology is not a barrier. The engineers can do this right now. The question is, do we believe and will we collaborate? No doubt this is going to be hard, but we've done it before and we can make this work. The Generous Foundation grant is the catalyst for the type of sweeping change that is so needed in healthcare. We ask you to continue to build upon the great work that all of you are doing, and importantly, join us on this journey. Patients can wait no longer. Clinicians can wait no longer. The country needs this now. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'm also pleased to announce, in support of the program's approach, that the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Engineering, who has joined us here, will convene later this year leaders from academic medicine and engineering, medical and information technology, with patients and families and healthcare systems to help catalyze this change. In addition, the patient care program includes work with Health Affairs, who has joined us today, University of California, San Francisco, Stanford, and others. For this afternoon, we are very privileged to convene a panel to comment on the various aspects of the Foundation's patient care program. Mary Naylor, director of the new Cortland Center for Transitions in Health at the University of Pennsylvania, will open and moderate the panel. So if I could have the panel join us here, and Mary will introduce the panel and begin the discussion. Where are you going? We have a seat. Wow, what an extraordinary day. I am absolutely thrilled and honored to be joining each of you in this audience and those on the webcast uh, and each of the panel members in welcoming you uh, along with Steve and George to an extraordinary launch of a program that some of us have been waiting for for a long, long time. I'm thrilled and honored to be joined on the panel by a group that will represent to you the multiple perspectives on patient engagement, on family caregiver engagement, on systems change that need to be well integrated to achieve and realize the bold and courageous vision that we've heard about today. To my immediate left, I'm thrilled to welcome Mike Armstrong, who's chairman of Johns Hopkins Medicine Board of Trustees, Jim Guest, president and CEO of Consumer Reports, you've met George, and congratulations, Peter and the Armstrong Institute, uh, Nicole James, who is a patient advocate, and my bookend on the other, Lou Sandy, Senior Vice President, Clinical Advancement, United Health Group. Their detailed bios are in the briefing material that you have, so we wanted to really maximize on this opportunity to share first some perspectives from each of us on this program, and then to open it up to you. Each of you near that yellow rose at the center of your table will find cards. So as you're hearing more about this program and 
or the ways in which we believe it can really be implemented to accelerate the kind of change and realize the vision that you've heard about, you have a chance to ask us questions. Those on the webcast, uh, welcome. You have a chance to type in questions, and we will, they will be gathered by teams and brought up uh, so that we have a rich conversation about this opportunity. Now, there's no one in this room, and you've already heard eloquently from Steve and George about the meaning of patient and family caregiver engagement. This is something that I have come to know in my work for the last couple of decades in ways that I hope to share with you to uh, reinforce the unbelievable excitement about the work that we will, will be unleashed starting today, but that has already been underway um, by many of the teams and organizations represented here today. We know that patient-centered care, as the Institute of Medicine has told us, is a hallmark of quality. We know from the Center for Advancing Health that patient and caregiver engagement gives us the greatest opportunity to think about ways that people can be involved in the decisions that matter most to them, that family caregivers, when appropriate, can be brought into uh, that decision making, that they can then take actions that enable them to maximize on the things that give them meaning and purpose, that gives them a sense of health. And that's not always the way uh, that we define it. Uh, many, many decades ago, I, uh, when a very young child, launched with a team, multidisciplinary team, a program of research that focuses on older adults, chronically ill older adults in this country, who arguably are um, vast consumers of healthcare resources, but are not always getting the care that they deserve. And our team began a journey funded by the National Institute of Health to help us to understand how to create better safety nets uh, for people and their families navigating a fragmented care system. We demonstrated early, very early, that we could get to better care against the current way that we deliver care. We also followed what happened to these people over the long haul and found that our interventions did not stick. We could reduce readmissions for 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, but when we really tracked what was happening to people, we realized that these were not outcomes that were being sustained over time. So what made the difference for us and our team? Along the journey, we realized that it was because we were imposing on these patients and families what we thought was in their best interest, um, that we were able to get some meaningful change, but only for a short time. It was their stories. They're telling us what it was that was important to them that I think was a turning point for us. Uh, there was a story in the Washington Post about a decade ago of Mr. Clifford Lynn, and he became emblematic to our team and to the many people who have supported our team over the years. Uh, Mr. Lynn's story was one of someone living in his home, unable to access the outside world except via an ambulance that took him to the emergency room or hospital. Uh, he lived with a loving wife in South Philadelphia, and they absolutely did not think that this was going to be the way that their golden years were spent. Uh, so we became involved with Mr. Lin, and we found out that what would give him some sense of meaning and value was to get him back in a woodworking shop in his garage uh, that gave him a sense of pleasure, um, a sense that I'm here to make a contribution and to do something that gives me uh, pride. Mrs. Lin's goal was to get Mr. Lin out of the house. Uh, and in this way, for the first time, patients and family caregivers' goals were aligned. So that picture, now getting a little bit old, is what guides us in our understanding about the pivotal role, pivotal, of patients and family caregivers for sustained, long-term change. And that's what we need to get to higher value, to get to better improvements, to focus on the things that Mr. Lynn cares about, that Mrs. Lynn cares about, improvements in function and quality of life. And when we do that, we get to affordable care. So that was part of our journey. The second part was figuring out how it is that we could move from a care delivery system to a system that made Mr. Lynn's experience the rule and not the exception. And that, may I say, is a work in progress. Uh, we've built a lot of tools to help systems figure out how to recreate, re-envision 
a sense of shared roles, a sense of shared responsibilities, new sense of accountability, built uh, the kinds of quality monitoring and quality improvement systems that need to change the way that we structure our relationships with patients and families. But it is a path. It's not a completed journey. And so we are tremendously excited that the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has embarked on a vision that will help accelerate all of the work of so many here um, and so many throughout the country and the globe to dramatically think about a re-envisioned care system where patients and families are front and center. That path forward begins for us. Um, and I am the great fortune to be a part of the National Advisory Group for this program, begins today, renews ourselves again today in a conversation with many extraordinary people who will share what it is that they think this kind of opportunity can bring. So let us begin where we should, with the patient's perspective on this program. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nicole James. I have sickle cell anemia, I'm 37 years old. Sickle cell is a hereditary blood disorder. It causes red blood cells, which are normally round, to be shaped like a sickle, and they carry less, blood, less oxygen throughout the body. As a sickle cell anemic, I experience episodes that are called pain crises, and it can range, it's excruciating pain that can range from a single joint throughout your, or your entire body. In 2008, I had a pain crisis that carried me to the hospital and took me a little bit to be treated, but after I was, I responded really well to, medic to the pain meds that I received and the IV fluids. I was up, walking around, joking with family like I I'd usually do, and I thought that I was gonna be out of there in a day or so. In the background, my doctor that was treating me uh, read my x-ray, my chest x-ray, and he diagnosed me with pneumonia. He proceeded to treat me for the pneumonia without having any discussion with me. Unfortunately, I responded negatively to the medication, and I ended up um, going back into crisis, one that was worse than the one that I originally came in to be treated for. If he had chosen to actually speak with me, he would have learned that I have scar tissue on my lungs. And what he was looking at wasn't actually a pneumonia. So what, turned, what could have been a day or so in the hospital ended up being two weeks in the hospital. And it, takes me, it took me, I mean, it, it just increases your cost, my cost for being in there in the first place. It increased the cost of my insurance company. And it takes me away from my life, what I, the things I like to do and the things that I value. So it's really scary, and you don't like to think about it on a daily basis, but the truth is that every single time I go to the hospital, there is a chance that I'm not coming out. And you never want that to happen. So I'm really, really thrilled to be a part of this today. I'm thrilled to know that there is a program like this, and for patients everywhere, I'd like to say a huge thank you. Thank you for hearing us, thank you for caring, and thank you for making a difference. Wow. <laughs> thank you, Nicole, for you sharing your story. Uh, this is the kind of story that we do need front and center to make sure that we are on a path in alignment with you and wanting to achieve what you want to achieve. Uh, Jim, you have a chance to hear perspectives from multiple consumers about the healthcare system and path forward. So your thoughts? I was gonna say, the, I thought the early remarks were truly inspiring. And in some ways, I think you most of all reinforce what this is all about, so thank you. I, I, it's terrific what the, what the foundation is doing, and I think the time is right. There's more attention being given to healthcare than ever before, and I really like the goal that uh, both the, the, you and, uh, and, and Steve both articulated of to eliminate all preventable patient harm. And I like the fact, um, Steve, when you let off, you're saying um, be ambitious, uh, be transformative, and I think there's a real opportunity to do it. Uh, 
what was it, 1999, the Institute of Medicine came out with its um, report that, that the air is human. We, we did consumer reports, we did a 10 year update uh, in, in uh, 2009 entitled The Air is Human, The Delay is Deadly. Because by our analysis, and uh, actually it's a conservative estimate, a million lives have been lost unnecessarily during that decade. I think what the foundation is doing here is saying, finally, that's not acceptable and working with a number of outfits that are engaged in this issue, doing something about it. And from a consumer perspective, it's kind of interesting. You had some, some statistics about when people aren't told about their medications or aren't consulted on different things. We've done a couple of surveys of interest. One is, um, in a survey we did recently, 57%, nearly six out of 10, of, this is a random adult population, said, um, they believe that, that errors are, are likely or somewhat likely in a hospital. Medical errors are likely or somewhat likely. 62% um, said that they fear uh, that a family member will be a victim of a medical error. So there's, there's not trust in the system, and in fact there's not the prevention in the system that, that both of you have, have, have talked about. Um, we also, and it's kind of interesting, uh, we did a survey of what drives patient satisfaction. And I think we're seeing more and more that uh, the healthcare industry needs to pay attention to patient satisfaction. The number one driver is uh, my, my, my provider explains things to me clearly. And the number two driver is my provider listens to me. And that notion of explaining and listening goes to the things you were talking about. It goes to cost, it goes to preventing medical errors and other, other harm and so forth. I think it's really crucial, and I also think, by the way, that having those kind, that kind of engagement uh, is going to, number one, deliver on the, on the uh, sort of the promise that's been made, or, the, or people ever talk about patient-centered care. <laughs> it's not a reality. This is to deliver on what's been held there as what people are looking for. Clearly, it will reduce, it'll improve outcomes and, and reduce harm. And I actually would make the point that I think it's good for business as well. Uh, as healthcare is changing and the delivery system is changing, uh, providers need to pay attention to what um, patients are doing and saying uh, and pay attention to what those numbers that I uh, mentioned have to, have to do. Um, so in terms of the communication, can talk more about it later, but th there's, there's a tendency to think uh, those who deal with this in the medical field, you know, I know what patients want. They don't. Uh, you said, don't, don't, <laughs> don't presume and sure. Yeah. You don't know what patients want unless you really, truly ask and listen, and listen with an open mind. You know, in some ways, it's almost as simple as that. I don't want to yeah. overstate it, but yeah. the notion of really paying attention and listening without preconceived notions. And also to realize that all patients are different. You can't categorize by demographics or ethnicity or anything else like that. Every patient is different and needs to be listened to. Uh, my optimism is that I think with what people in the room are doing here, with what the foundation is doing, uh, there really is the, the opportunity. And I'm gonna say, I think you're gonna achieve success. We will achieve success eventually on it. And I really applaud the foundation, by the way, in seeking out the consumer perspective, because all too often, uh, folks in the medical field say, yes, of course, the patient comes first, assume what the patient wants, and don't really get the consumer perspective, and that's one thing the foundation is doing. I'm gonna hold out a vision of what the future could be. This is a, um, a letter that a woman in Maine who's been involved as a patient advocate said before she went into the hospital for a, a significant procedure. She sent this letter to everybody in the hospital that she could anticipate was going to be involved in her care. And here's what she said. Be patient with my questions, because if I ask, I don't know the answers. Listen to my concerns and my husband's. Remember that although he is not medically trained, after 40 years of marriage, he knows a whole lot better than any of you do. <laughs> Once I'm in my room, please don't ask him, my lifeline, to leave my side. He will take a load off your nursing staff and help keep me safe. And that's the vision I see for the future. Lou, huge, important expectations from Nicole and from Jim representing the consumer perspectives. How well are we positioned as a system to take advantage and 
make sure that this patient's plea and Nicole's compelling story uh, help inform a very different healthcare system going forward. Well, well, thanks, Mary. And I, like you, have been on the National Advisory Committee for this program. And I am also thrilled and privileged to have been a, a part of it. And I think we all know that um, the time is now for all the reasons that George said. Uh, I've been a primary care physician, practiced for over 20 years. I now work at United Health Group, a diversified healthcare company that is trying to apply technology and advanced care management to care for over 70 million Americans. And we know the, the problems. And I think, from my perspective, there are two sets of issues. The first is we know improvement is possible. Everybody has a story. Um, my wife ended, needed emergency surgery for a spinal cord compression. I actually uh, had her, found her a very good neurosurgeon, found her a terrific academic health center, not Hopkins, but almost as good. <laughs> and I was a little worried about her and, you know, given her condition. And my father said, Lou, you should feel very good. You found her the best specialist. You found her the best institution. She's going in for surgery in the morning. You can now relax and let the system do what it does. <laughs> and I said, Dad, you don't understand how hospitals work. Um, and we know that this is a, a target-rich environment for all the reasons that George and Peter said. And yet the, the improvements are done one at a time. I think you said it perfectly. And then on the other hand, we all know it's important to engage, it's critical to engage patients and families in their perspective. And many of you in this room have been working, have been toiling in this vineyard for decades. And the problem that I think the Moore Foundation has identified is that this is good, but it is not connected to a supportive healthcare system, that theory of change. So the things that I'm most excited about, about this program, are really, first, the idea of the big tent the idea that we have to collaborate and work together. The second, this idea of design, the engineering disciplines. To it, why should you have to be heroic to make it happen? Why doesn't it just happen automatically? And the third is the idea of innovation. We need this kind of innovation to apply the best minds, technology, to basically, in a nutshell, have the care delivered to us, to us as patients, to our families, that we would like the kind that Nicole deserves, the kind of thing that would prevent in the future from anyone having to go through what she went through. So again, I'm thrilled, excited. I applaud the foundation, and I'm privileged to have been part of the advisory committee. Thanks, Lou. Well, Mike, uh, this all says to me, leadership. This is going to be about unbelievable leadership within systems, across systems, to realize this vision. I'm wondering if you could share some perspectives on, as the head of a board of trustees on the big system, how do you get there? How do we, what's the path forward? Uh, <coughs> thank you, Mary. Uh, may I share first an observation? Yes. That uh, I'm not the youngest uh, <laughs> member of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that permits me to go back and reflect that many decades ago, when I was with the IBM company, uh, we invested in Intel. And I had the opportunity to meet Gordon Moore. And I know that he would be very proud today of what's being done. And I congratulate the foundation, and I thank them for their commitment to not getting rid of most of the infections, or not some curve on the infection or not some preventable harm someday, but all preventable harm is your objective and your approach of taking a systems view with a focus on patients and family is extraordinary. And we at Hopkins and in the Institute are 100% aligned with you. There's two reasons for that commitment that is, if I may, Mary, Call it a passion. Uh, the first, like the coal, I had a personal experience of preventable harm that almost cost me my life. Back in the 90s, when I took on a new career path at Hughes, I got a physical exam phone call from the doctor of not Hopkins, but an academic medical center, where I had my annual physicals, like I'm sure many people who are nodding in the audience. 
And it started with a strange beginning. The doc said, Mike, I am so sorry. We apologize. We made an awful mistake. A year ago, your blood counts precipitously declined and we missed it. Today, they are dangerously low and you must immediately take action. What action are you talking about? Some pills and shots and... No, he said, you have leukemia. And I suggest you go to the best on the West Coast, which is a UCLA Cancer Medical Center, and Dr. Bob Gale will see you. Long story short, I had leukemia, and I was put on a clinical trial. I was the 100th person in a 100-person clinical trial. And after the chemotherapy was completed, they took it all out, I went home, went to bed, blood counts about zero, and woke up about 10 o'clock with 104 degree temperature. So I called up Dr. Gale, and I said, uh, wow, I think uh, something's gone haywire, it's 104 degree temperature. He said, you've got to get immediately to the ICU, but we can't come get you. I said, what do you mean you can't come get me? He said, well, the riots. I said, what riots? I've been asleep. He said, well, the, Ro the Rodney King riots are tearing up Los Angeles, and there's no way we can get ambulance to you. You've got to get in your car, go through the riots, and get to the ICU. <laughs> so you talk about a complication to start with. <laughs> So we maneuvered through the riots, and that's another story, and got there. And if you've never visited or spent any time in a leukemia ICU, the adult and the children's, there's only one word for it, and that's terrifying. Because you've got a race going on, your blood count's zero, you've obviously got, got a bad infection, and these antibiotics we hope will work. Seven days later, because it's a short battle, either up or down. I was the only patient on both floors to walk out and go home. And it didn't have to happen. But there was another experience out on the West Coast that really got my attention. At Hughes, we built a couple of things. Uh, one was Tomahawk missiles, the other satellites. Now, when Mary says all preventable harm is going to be eliminated, that's perfection. That's zero defects, that's Sig Sigma, there's lots of words for it, but it's perfection. Now, one of the things that you don't want a Tomahawk missile to do <laughs> is be errant <laughs> or have a mistake in it. Second. We provide electronics and radars for the Boeings and the Lockheeds for commercial aircraft. You and I step aboard an airplane today. We expect and they deliver perfection. At Hopkins a few years ago, um, in the medication area, we looked in the mirror because we had hundreds of medication errors every year although we issued millions of medication orders from docs. And we said, let's systematize this. And we flowcharted it. And it turned out from the time the doc wrote the prescription until the nurse stuck the needle in, there were 100 manual steps. Each one could cause preventable harm, and they did. And we systematized it, we automated it, we integrated it, we standardized it, and today it is Six Sigma. And so in teaming up with the Moore Foundation to deliver perfection and eliminate all preventable harm, we are very proud, Mary.
Wow, these stories are, I think, what everyone in this audience will leave with. Uh, and I am really torn between how to start, but I want you all to start raising your questions, but both Mike and Nicole, and Nicole, if we could start with you. I was really uh, blown away in George's introduction by language around dignity and respect and you have reinforced this, this sense of who I am, my uniqueness as a human being. And I, I'm wondering if you could uh, uh, share some of the ways in which those of us on the clinical teams uh, could be more responsive to that, could really leave you at the end of each encounter with a sense that you are the most respected person um, that we are meeting today. I would say to ask questions. Um, when I got to Hopkins, the first doctor that I did meet with there, we sat down and had a conversation about who I am and what I, what I do um, and, the, and the history of my medical background um, before we even got to treatment. And finding out what my goals are, what's important to me, what I value, and giving me permission to speak and letting me know that you want to hear what I have to say is very important, and all that takes is the ask. Jim, this is going to be changing, I think, rather dramatically consumers' expectations. On the one hand, uh, can you give some thought and share with us how you think we can get consumers engaged in changing those expectations? And once we do, how do we spread this so that the millions of people that our system serve are really coming to us with Nicole's sense of, you should be asking me questions. We should be talking to each other about our plan. Let me answer that, but as you were speaking, it occurred to me a conversation I had with Don Berwick a couple of years ago, who said, he told me what he did with the first several months when he set out to start the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. He went and spent several weeks at NASA trying to figure out how they went about, in a systems way, uh, preventing errors. So this notion uh, that the foundation has of linking patient and family engagement with systems, I think, make, makes a lot of sense. And that really is something different from what's happened before. In terms of how to engage patients, I mean, in some ways, uh, let me talk about at an individual way and then more in a, in a systemic way. On the individual way, again, it comes back to, to listening and paying attention and communicating. And I would urge, especially as some of the early work is being done with hospitals, uh, a couple of things. Especially those who have had medical errors or medical harm, bring them in and talk to them and ask them, how do you think we could change what we're doing uh, so that what happened to you wouldn't happen or, or, or would, 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 could be prevented, or how your experience in the hospital could have been, could have been better. Bring people in, especially those who've had a problem. Uh, in industry, they talk about the dissatisfied customer is your best source of information for how to, how to improve. And then I'm thinking kind of in a systemic way. Some of you may be aware that um, uh, the last couple of years, most, re most recently in August, Consumer Reports uh, put out hospital ratings. I think we had something in the neighborhood of 1,500, 2,000 hospitals, maybe even more than that. And it had to do with, among other things, patient engagement, medical, uh, uh, hospital acquired infections and so forth. And what we've learned, several hospitals have come to us, and you've had some experience also, Peter, you talked about. Um, we put the ratings out to help consumers make choices, but I think the real impact is a hospital doesn't want to be at the low end of those ratings and a board of directors or trustees of a hospital is, it doesn't want to have the hospital in that way. And so I think this whole notion of being transparent, not only transparent in the individual conversation, but transparent on how an institution is doing can have a profound impact. Uh, so these changing metrics, changing expectations, uh, to me, Lou, this is a cultural transformation on the clinical team's end. Uh, not having hemoglobin A1C as the goal, but uh, Nicole preventing harm, all harms for Nicole as a goal. Uh, how do we get 
a new workforce prepared for this? Well, I think you're right. I think it is a cultural uh, transformation, and yet I'm very optimistic because if you actually talk to nurses and doctors about what it is they want to do, they want to deliver the care that works for the patient. But the, and the, Peter made this point in his remarks. But they themselves are under constraints, pressures, and things from, frankly, poorly designed systems, whether these are the operational systems in hospitals or even the organization and financing system broadly in healthcare. So um, all of this is going to require a cultural transformation. And what we see today is well-meaning clinicians working in poorly designed systems, how they feel is they feel like they don't have time to really engage with the patient and the family, but really they don't have time not to if they really want to achieve the kinds of goals. But we can't just exhort them to do it. We really have to engineer the system that makes it easy for them to do it and makes it easy for the patients and families to engage as well. Mary, I would add that it, uh, we did a little study that showed a nurse answers a false positive alarm every 90 seconds. How on earth could they deliver, have time to do any meaningful care when they're running around answering these alarms? And all these new devices have new alarms and none of them talk. And I mean, we really are just setting clinicians up for dissatisfaction and for patients to not get the care that they deserve. Uh, so Peter, we talked a little bit last evening about, you're talking about starting in the ICU with the kind of system change uh, that enables everyone served in that ICU to walk out with no harm. And yet we know that system change is going to require what happens to all of those patients as they move to the next unit and as they move from the hospital back into the community. Can you talk a little bit about how do we have this multiplier effect in building longitudinal systems uh, that ac can accomplish? You're absolutely right, Mary, and there's uh, no shortage of places to start this work. I mean, this could have started with chronic diseases, and when we, when we were planning this approach, we got clinicians together to list all the harms patients suffer in the ICU and all the therapies that they would need to prevent them, which is where we got our 200 things. At that meeting, we had a number of primary care doctors and geriatricians who care for chronically ill patients, as you do, and they said, you know, this is the exact same thing for patients with chronic diseases. They're probably at risk for, you know, a dozen or more harms. They probably have to do 200 things every day. No one's ever listed them. We don't automate them. We don't even know if they're capable of doing it. And so there's a lot of places. We started in the ICU in some sense, Mary Beth, we're sadistic, because it's the hardest. I mean, if we could get respectful and dignified care in an ICU, we hopefully should be able to expand upon that anywhere. And there's data sources there, so it's a technology-rich place that our engineering colleagues could link up and we could learn in a controlled way how to integrate these devices and then spread it you know, eventually both to inpatient and then to outpatient. But the principles that will guide us about transparency and data and integration and patients as the North Star, I think, are the same. I want to get to this notion of, uh, as you describe this, because this is a shared responsibility, uh, uh, unit to unit, uh, shared responsibility among clinical team members and patients, uh, and this whole notion of accountability. Um, so, Mike, you know, how do you create within a system the sense that we're all going to be working together to accomplish this? How do you expect? You know, set the expectations so people understand you want to be part of our system. Here's what we're holding you up to accomplish. Well, that's a key word, accountability. Uh, and you have to do, whether you're talking about the nurses or the interns uh, or the residents or the doctors or the board of trustees, a commitment and a passion to solve this problem. And so uh, by bringing together the facts or the analytics or the research as to what does it mean when we say preventable harm and how much harm is really going on? Your number was quite alarming, a decade and a million deaths due to preventable harm. Now, where is it sourced? 
Is it in the catheters? Is it in the surgical procedures? Is it blood infections only? Is it in uh, bacterial infections? Is it bad handoffs, poor communications, wrong assumptions? Whether you're at this level or at the board level, if you don't understand the source of the problem, it's pretty hard to get people accountable to solve the problem. Once you've got that work done, whether it's for the hospital or the system, then you've got to enable the forum to bring all the providers together. Because nothing works by itself, whether it's the ICU or the regular hospital room. Those who have been patients, and I bet there's not a hand that would go up, who's not a patient in this room. When we expect perfection, it's at our level. The patient's a person, and we expect to walk out, and we don't expect to be harmed, and that means anything that goes into that room, both people and products, must be systematized. And so once the people understand the problem, their contribution to the problem, the design of the system, products, interfaces, standards, protocols, productivity, integration, has to take place to deliver the perfection we're talking about. Uh, so there are a number of questions, and some of them center on the Hopkins program going forward. And so the uh, questions about, uh, specific to the Hopkins programs are how will patients be directly involved in the implementation? Will they be on the steering committee beyond being recipients of care? Sure, absolutely. So the, the, the patients will help design this system. So as we're planning this, as my engineering colleagues have uh, really schooled us on, they say healthcare has never defined the goals it wants. I mean, and, and how could you set up a system without explicit prioritized goals? So in this case, you know, our goals are eliminating preventable harm, because harm will never be respectful, optimize patient experience and outcomes, and reduce costs in that order. We have patients on our committee designing what that looks like. So what does it mean to optimize experience? What do they, they, they really want to do? In addition to designing it, we believe uh, deeply that patients need to be actively involved in the care process. So we use these terms patient engagement, and, and uh, but if we're ambiguous about the expected behaviors, it'll never happen. So in, in, in this case, we've at least articulated initially three very clear behaviors. That patients will actively participate in their care to the extent they want. That we will meet their needs. And as Nicole said, we then have, first have to ask what their needs are that, that we meet, but we will meet their needs and we will ensure that they leave knowing how to self-care and being comfortable in, in that self-care. And as a starting point, that's part of the engagement that the patients who were on our initial planning group really wanted to make sure that we, we do these things. So it's a journey that we will be holding hands together on and iterating and correcting us. And no doubt we'll make missed courses. But I think if the patient stays as our North Star, we'll get to the right place. So, and Yes, yeah, please continue. I'm not supposed to be part of this answer, but yeah, I have to. Yeah, you can. <laughs> Actually, we can all, yes. Uh, to add to Peter's comments, at Hopkins, uh, about eight years, seven, eight years ago, uh, we redesigned the medical education curriculum and about three years introduced it. Uh, and if I had to use two words of the curriculum that goes back 99 years in American education of our docs, today it's called personalized medicine. That's the underpinning of it, whether it's our genealogy, our molecular makeup, our heredity, our obesity, our diet, our exercise, our stress. But docs today are not only being trained in all the science of caring, but on the patient to care. So this builds on directly on a question uh, that says, it's not just about docs anymore. It's about clinical teams. And how do we prepare uh, nurses, physicians, and other health professionals to work in a context of teams with patients and family caregivers at the center. So George or others want to talk about your envision of how the training or preparation of teams, interprofessional work, um, is central to you? I appreciate that question. Um, as, as Steve McCormick had said, um, 
The foundation had started its work with the Betty Irene Moore Nursing Initiative and the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at University of California at Davis. Um, I'm a physician. I um, didn't know about nursing. Um, however, a lot of nurses very patiently explained to me what it is to be a nurse. What is the profession? What is the sense of obligation that a nurse has that supports and aligns with the physician, but is different? And so for me, that was an education, a real education and a real moment of appreciation. And from that, I'm so pleased that we have some of our sister foundations here, such as the Jonas Foundation and the Hartford Foundation, who are working with us to build a sense of interprofessional team care. One of the things that Betty Moore told us is she said, I want all of you, speaking to the people who are taking care, I want all of you to work together. I don't want to talk to a nurse and then talk to another nurse who doesn't know what the other nurse is talking about, who doesn't know what the doctor is. Now that seems just imminently reasonable. So we are working with others to develop the sense of interprofessional team-based care, both at the level of um, education, as, as Mike had described, graduate medical education, even before going into medical school. That's one of the things that University of California Davis School of Nursing is developing as interprofessional team-based care, but also in practice. And I'm glad that Joe Selby of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute is here because there's a lot of research that needs to be done and will be done in understanding how do we address research questions around interprofessional team-based care. I think it goes back to what Mike was saying and what Nicole has said. Keep clear what it is that we want. We do not want to hurt patients, whether it's bodily harm, a loss of dignity and respect. Second, give me feedback that I can understand and that I can take action on. Don't feed me data I don't understand. Help me understand what I need to do, and if need be, help me use the words. Help me use the phrases. Help me be a better nurse, pharmacist, x-ray technician, whoever it is. We are so dedicated, those of us in healthcare. We want to do the very best. Help us learn. And I think it begins with that. Both the humility of I want to learn and the respect of I will help you learn. You know, may, may yes. One comment on this because it's a crucial point is that medicine has grown up with a belief that the only domain of wisdom is how many years you've trained. So the senior doctor has more wisdom than the junior doctor on, on and we fail to realize that experiential wisdom or tacit wisdom, time with the disease or the patient is as important if not more an important domain of knowledge as uh, formal book learning, and those hierarchies are completely inverse. So on the tacit wisdom, it's the family and the patient one, and then the nurse and me as an attending physician, I'm on the bottom of that hierarchy, and I have to be humble enough to say there's wisdom from others, right? and put those together, and we're likely to arrive at a better decision. And we, I know in our medical school, we're in our nursing school, really encouraging people to appreciate this, this second epistemology. The other concrete example is we started a course called The Hospital. And in it, our medical students work as a nurse. We, you know, within their roles, they work as a physical therapist. No lectures, they work as a dietitian. They spend time as a hospital administrator to roll up their sleeves and say, what is it that these people do? Because I'm going to be working with as a team, but they have no context for what these other people really do. And every one of them, it's eye-opening to say, well, I guess I always thought of the nurse as a nurse as a nurse. Well, you don't realize, no, no, very different levels of an NP and a senior nurse and a new nurse, just like there are in doctors, and they need to appreciate that. Well, music to my ears. Uh, this is, <laughs> there are so many rich questions here. So let me try to frame some that have to do with uh, how you create a culture which of no harm 
and yet an environment in which there is a just culture orientation. And I'm wondering, Mike, if that's, you know, how do you set these expectations of perfection and at the same time realize the human parts of our system? Well, it gets back to a thing that you put forward before and Peter spoke to, uh, that awareness, understanding, and insight will lead to responsibility and accountability. Many people in the system, Peter was talking about all the levels and the grades and the seniority and the juniors, need to understand that they are responsible for the well-being, the care, and the outcome of the patient. The patient is a person. And if, as a team, they take responsibility and accountability, and you have to reinforce that, normally, Culture change either happens because of great leadership that just pounds, 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 or some event, like happened to Hopkins that Peter was describing in his talk, where we all stepped back and said, that could never happen to us. How could that little girl, Josie King, die as she died at Hopkins Hospital? So today, when we have a million deaths in a decade, which is probably an underestimate, I think we're at the point where we need to combine the shock of what we're doing to patients and drive the accountability with analytics, with training, with education and responsibility. Uh, this is very, very important and related to this. And Lou, I want to turn to you because someone has written that harm, the harm that we're talking about, can be an absolutely the results of the delay in the application of evidence. So we've heard about what it takes to produce rigorous evidence and what it takes to get it into systems and to get people positioned, as Mike has described, with the tools and resources requires rapid movement. So how are we going to get from a 15-year yeah. implementation? Well, the two things that come to my mind in this discussion, um, I think, and speaks to something Mike raised earlier, um, around the issue of um, inertia and the issue of incentives. And I think one of the cultural features of health systems, from my experience and efforts over several decades um, through other work in my career at another health foundation to try and stimulate improvement, is just the tremendous inertia that exists within um, healthcare systems. Mary, your example of you showed it could be done, but, you know, it hasn't happened, and it's because we, we have so many inertial forces to overcome. One part of the solution, in addition to getting focused and having a movement really emerge out of programs like this, is also the issue of incentives and aligned incentives. There's really one reason that we have this problem in this country is there's no incentive not to have it, frankly. Um, and that gets to Mike's comments around accountability, uh, to measurement, if there was a dashboard that let the Johns Hopkins system know when it, where it was green, where it was yellow, and where it was red, you can bet they would take action. But there is no such dashboard. So that's what I think Peter and this program are intending to catalyze and stimulate, starting in the most, on one hand, technologically rich from a clinical and scientific point of view, but among the most bewildering and hazardous from a system point of view, the intensive care unit. Nicole. I wanted to highlight, as Steve McCormick had described, the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, we are all about transformation and having collective impact. And the way that we intend to have collective impact in all of our programs, but especially in the patient care program, is to design systems. It's just as you said, Mike, if you don't have a system, it's hard to know, in fact, that innovation will spread. Many of you may have read uh, Atul Gawande's article recently in The New Yorker where he talked about the cheesecake factory as applied to medicine. Now, we may not all agree with that, but one thing he did say, it takes too long to get a great idea into widespread adoption. And one of the things that the foundation is interested in and will support is how to achieve large-scale adoption at scale. And we think that a systems approach is the way to do it. 
It's as though we wanted to communicate from this part of the room to that part of the room, and we have Michael McGinnis with a Dixie cup and a little string going over here. That's how quickly communication spread. When an IM crosses the globe, thanks to AT&T, at that rate, <laughs> that's what we need, a system, a coherent, optimally designed system so that rapidity of innovation is a reality as it is everywhere else. Remember the co-founder of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, Gordon Moore, innovation rapidly at scale. I, I, I want to just add, yes. you know, this whole notion of, it's been referenced, sort of the culture change, and part of what's happening is kind of changing from within as you've been describing. But I sort of talk about four myths that the public has that it's going to take quite a lot of time to overturn. One is that more is better. Another is that there no, that, um, that, that tests, that diagnostic uh, tests have no downside. Another is that the more something costs, the better it is. And the final one is that docs and providers are making judgments based on evidence. And there are sort of four major myths. And it's not going to be easy to overturn those. But as part of the change in the healthcare system, as we move to it, whether it's accountable care organizations, whatever it may be, those myths need to be dispelled. Now, they can happen kind of one at a time. I'm struck that it was a specific incident, a story, that drove um, in significant, uh, significant way what, what happened at Hopkins. Or a story, you know, think of a number of changes that have happened in public attitudes or institutional behaviors. And so this whole notion of, of building on stories and getting stories out there, I think, is going to be key. And I'll give you my favorite. I mentioned it. it has to do with medical devices. Those of you who are familiar with the federal law on medical devices, um, one of the provisions, we tried to get a change this year, we didn't, is that if a new medical device is similar to a medical device that had been approved previously by the FDA, it automatically gets approved, even if the original device had subsequently been found to be unsafe and harmful. I mean, something is wrong. <laughs> stories like that, stories like that need to get out. And the public needs to understand that it's not um, just, you know, find the way things are. Well, stories like that, I think, will increasingly be getting out as a result of this program. Uh, Nicole, someone from the webcast wanted you particularly to reflect on this question, which is, what is your vision for including a patient and family as a true member of the healthcare team? Hmm. Well, I can honestly say I'm starting to see what that looks like a little bit. Um, I have a doctor, my, I have a primary care physician now, and my primary care physician knows every single other doctor that treats me. Um, and they know my family, which is also very important. So when I am in the hospital and I am in a pain crisis and unable to communicate, they can still keep that communication with my family because they know what my body needs. They know also because they've been there right alongside me the whole time. So the, having that whole network of collaborative care is, is incredibly important. And it makes me, as a patient, feel really safe. Uh, can I pursue one question that also is related to this? Um, and, I, and this is for anyone on the panel. But this issue of accountability, so someone has raised the question, so what regarding accountability, what does the clinician do if they feel the patient and family is not prepared to be a real partner in decisions. Who is accountable? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, one of the principles of medicine and all the healthcare professions, but certainly we, we hold it dear as, as physicians, is above all, do no harm. So if we were to say all patients have to come in and they have to do these things, whether they like it or not, they have to understand these things, whether or not we explain it in a way that's understandable to their cultural or social economic status. And we create anxieties and guilt. That is creating harm. So I would say the accountability resides first in understanding who each of us is. 
It means to understand the family dynamics, as you've described. It means to understand our role in the team-based interprofessional care that we provide. It means that we understand the components of how we roll across those who are at the front line of providing care to those who are on the board of trustees. I think it's understanding that and then having, as Nicole said, a conversation that may be a courageous conversation, particularly at the end of life, of trying to understand who was your mom? Tell us about your grandma. What would she have wanted? What kind of care would she have preferred? And so the accountability is across everyone, but I think it always begins, as Nicole had said, ask, ask, and always bear in mind that our desire to do good, but as always remember, do not harm. The respect to the personhood is to begin, as you said, Nicole. Could, could I ask. add something to what George said, because I think he's right. And I think it requires everyone has a role to play, all the stakeholders. We are very active at United Health Group in promoting consumer activation. And the word I wanted to highlight is engagement. If you just think about Nicole's story, what was really the gap? The gap was there was no engagement, basically. There was kind of an assumption that if, if only people had engaged with you, none of that would have happened, right? So there has to be. And people get nervous when they basically say, well, am I picking up, I think underneath that question is, you know, am I being asked to do something that is beyond what I can really deliver? It's not beyond anyone's capability to simply engage and just talk to people. So that's where I, I think that's really the place to start. Can I the, add as well? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I think um, the real, there's a, a reality that's there and all life comes to an end at some point. I've lost my mom to breast cancer and my mom, you know, fought it out, but when you're in the end, when you're in those final stages, if you've had this type of program in place, it's easier to swallow. It makes it easier and it's it's more comforting. The road is the road is what's important. It's not necessarily the outcome and when the road is making sure that everybody is being taken care of and the quality care is there, then some are able to thrive. But the, the truth is, there are some that won't. You know, and, and that's a reality that also needs to be accepted. Well, this very much connects to one of the questions, which has to do with you know, starting this program in the ICU, a high tech environment, but people's needs changing. Uh, to not require, in fact, often they, those high-tech interventions can be harmful. How do we, in this case, what are the greatest opportunities for technology, including the use of low-tech methods to best support patients? And do we see a great place for this in the evolution of this program? Yes, so I'll, I'll take a stab in that, and I'll give you a couple examples. Um, the you, the taxpayers, invested somewhere about $2 billion studying this disease called acute lung injury. About 200,000 people get it a year. It has a 40 45% mortality. And Michael Gropper knows this well. And after two decades and $2 billion of research, the main finding that lowers mortality is if we give small breaths on the breathing machine. Right? That, that, that's the main thing we learned from that. And we do that somewhere between 20 to 40% of the time, 20 to 40%. Now, you can say doc, nurse work harder, but what we also know is that the ventilator doesn't know whether you have this disease because it doesn't communicate with the electronic health record that has that diagnosis. If, again, in any other industry, they would talk and it would say, you have this disease, set the ventilator to give you what the evidence says, and we rely on, on, on heroism. Another example is we know uh, people suffer harm from lack of mobility and delirium, as you, some of the work you've done. And we've now, very low tech, started engaging patients' families to help them walk while they still have a breathing machine in. We've seen lower cost, lower length of stay, much better long-term outcomes 
by something as easy as getting them up and walking and engaging their families and helping them become ambulatory. So I think there's just a wealth of things we can do, but it all hinges on, as we all said, this culture of harm is inevitable and we're going to work towards that goal. If I'm listening to these questions, both on an individual level and an institutional level, I want to introduce another concept. We're in favor of transparency and trust and respect. It's going to be a somewhat foreign concept of humility. And I'm thinking of humility in two ways. It's humility in that conversation where you're saying, what if the patient doesn't really want to engage or the family or doesn't know how to engage? Humility on the part of the person who's communicating with them can ease that conversation tremendously. But you know, there's the other humility, which I'm going to say is institutional. And as you develop ways and systems that can be replicated, and that's one of the goals here, is be sure that something can, can be um, rolled out. There's going to be a real tendency for institutions other than UCSF and, uh, and, and uh, Johns Hopkins to say, wait a minute, we didn't invent this. We've got to come up with our own. And some way to uh, make it more palatable and more acceptable to, if somebody else has come up with something good, for God's sake, do it. Don't, uh, don't say, not invented here. You know, so, uh, Jim, if I could just add to that, because it's a key point. When we did our Michigan study with the checklist, people ask me all the time, could I see the Michigan checklist? And I chuckle and say, there were 103 ICUs, there's 103 checklists. Now, they're 98% the same, but that 2% difference is what made it work for them. And every one of them believes theirs is the best. And it absolutely is for their context, right? And so what we have to find this tension between standardizing it one way, but then engaging others to make it flexible. I have no doubt what Michael will do at UCSF will be better than what we did at Hopkins. And it will change, and it, and it needs to change. But the principles and the boundaries will still be, will still be guiding us. And that's why we're so excited to work with the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Engineering, because they will bring together all of these great places, not only University of California at San Francisco and Hopkins, but University of Pittsburgh, Vanderbilt, University of Michigan, Kaiser, Ascension, all of us that are working on this to come together and do exactly what Nicole says. Don't hurt me. Give me respect. Understand the dignity that I deserve. So I'm just going to, before turning it back to Steve, um, read something that someone proposed. And this is Moore's Law, that the number of patients in the US receiving perfect care doubles every quarter. The person also notes, I haven't done the math yet, but you get the idea. <laughs> thank you. Thank this guy. I, I really hate to be the one who draws this to a close, because I think we could, could keep a stimulating conversation going here. And I'm kind of embarrassed to draw it to a close. I, each person on this panel has like four or five you know, titles, PhD, MD, FPPC. And I noticed the organizers of the event inserted a JD by my name, which is, you know, all lawyers have a JD. So I, it's, it, it seems embarrassing that a JD is shutting down all of the titles here. Um, so let, let, let me just re, re, <laughs> reassert that our foundation is committed to uh, an indefinite involvement in improving patient care, that over the next 10 years, we are prepared to commit $500 million, and that it is our aspiration to eliminate all preventable harms and deaths. George Bernard Shaw uh, observed, I love this quote, the reasonable person adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable person persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable person. This room is full of unreasonable people. <laughs> and we look forward to working with you towards this high aspiration. Thank you all for joining us today.